morning, Richard Miller. I'm in Australia. Uh, we're starting up to, uh, different talks. Uh, we're talking to Philadelphia today, so we're back in America. And uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, sometimes we agree with people and sometimes we disagree with people, right? And uh, a lot of times that's our focus. Like, are we agreeing? Or is this, do I like this guy because he says what I want him to say? Or, you know, and then sometimes when we feel like we're deepening, then we start to say, okay, we should honor people from where they're at. You know, why do we have to agree? Why do we have to disagree? We could just listen. And maybe we don't even understand them, but we could still just receive them, right? And this is some enlightened way to, to get along with people, right? But uh, this morning we're talking to Dr. David Parrish and and uh, we agree <laughs> with a lot of things, so <laughs> here we are in the agree. Hello, David. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, we, uh, we spoke a little bit in the past, and um, it was apparent as we talked that there was a lot of agreement in, this, in, in the conversation. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I said in the conversation that we had was that uh, I think there needs to be a new conversation for people to listen to that uh, is different from what's been typically being said on the internet these days by you know most of the teachers that are out there teaching the spiritually oriented people and the others who are who are speaking um, so that's what I'm interested in well it's clear there's a lot of conditions in the world right and uh, we're trying to describe those conditions and then uh uh, we're looking on the internet, we're, we're talking to people, we're trying to uh, listening to uh, people that claim they know, and when they're describing them with the same words, then the conditions seem the same, right? So I would totally agree that we need some new words, right? And uh, who knows, people say that the, every minute is different, so let, uh, you know, the moment is constantly changing, let the words constantly change too. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I think that uh, we have to we have to start to think like that because uh, it's one thing for people to want to assist other people to experience what people have called the natural state or enlightenment or whatever you want to you want to call it, but that's an individual uh, experience, and uh, we live in a world where if that's all we're about, um, we may not be around long. Uh, you know that's. Uh, uh, if, if you look at the news and you look at the conditions around you and it's, uh, it's almost, a, it's more, it feels to me like it's getting more and more difficult uh, to deal with it, you know, especially as, uh, as my own awareness has expanded and my own compassion has expanded that it becomes more and more difficult to watch the news and to take a walk around the block and watch how the neighbors are, you know, uh, held hostage in their own homes, you know, and uh, just looking at people's faces and going into the supermarket and watching how people are so defended and isolated and protective uh, right. is disturbing. Right, okay, well, you can, you know, I mean, we can really fall in sync with uh, what we see and what is said out there, you know. And then, I guess the worst, the very worst thing is that we're held hostages by our own thoughts and by our own minds, right? I mean, because that's the hardest to get free of. If somebody else is holding me uh, hostage, I can maybe escape. But uh, sometimes it takes a lifetime to uh, escape my ideas and my conditioning. And, and let's just say that we, uh, uh, we want to say that uh, uh, our life is, in a way, uh, a game that we're being offered, you know, that we're a, we're a player, right? So then, in, in the sense that we're a player in our own life, that it, it's kind of a game, right? And we want to be effective in, in the way we play this game. And so then, we want to kind of uh, uh, look afresh. And uh, not buy other people's ideas and not necessarily buy our ideas from yesterday. And look afresh and look afresh and look afresh and allow something new to come in. I mean, what is creativity but, but somehow a, a fresh look? And uh, so, I'm, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is uh, I'm not really wanting to uh, get uh, blue about uh, world conditions and say that uh, uh, we're on the edge of... <laughs> extinction, right? We may well be, you know, and on certain levels. 
But I'm just saying, even if I want to play that game, I want to play it mo the most effective I can, and I think that takes a fresh look. And so, I don't know if you are in sync with that, but... Uh, uh, well, I, I, I am in sync with that. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I see creating a new conversation as, as important. And I, and I don't want to, you know, be depressed or run, run from people or run from life uh, either. In fact, um, what I see to be, to be the case is that uh, in order to make a difference in the world, uh, we have to start to think about possibilities. You know, what are the possibilities for us as human beings? And, you know, you just mentioned, you know, dealing with your own uh, being held hostage by your mind kind of thing and you know we uh, one of the things that I'm interested in right now is leadership because uh, I think one of the things that it's going to take to make a difference and when I say that I'm talking about impacting humanity I'm talking about uh, the difference that really matters in terms of what's going on around us in the world and one of the things it's going to take is for us to recognize a couple of things one is that um, much of what's gone on before this is not relevant anymore. Uh, the Internet changed everything in terms of our ability to communicate with each other and communicate with millions and millions of people around the world. I mean, you see things, yeah, you see these uh, Internet videos that go viral, and they could be the silliest things, and millions of people uh, in a short period of time watch these things. So it is possible, and we know that, uh, for example, in the in the Middle East, that the internet played a a large role in what's gone on there, as far as people deciding that they weren't going to continue to live in the same uh, political situation that they were in in the past, and so forth. Uh, the thing about leadership is that um, I think that one of the things that is critical and it's kind of secondary, I think, to a lot of people because they're looking for relief as far as their anxiety or depression or uh, being able to be more functional, effective in their life. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that people don't realize is in order to do that, uh, it, it's going to take something that's not spiritual. It's going to take kind of a willingness to look out there and see who is... Uh, working on things like leadership, a different kind of leadership, because, you know, um, we need to be able to lead our own lives. That's what you were referring to, you know, not to be held hostage by your own mind yeah. involves being able to lead well, your own Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm talking about hold, being held hostage by your own mind, but, you know, your mind to me and, and your verbal capacity and your, and your sense of uh, belief structures are also your, your emotions and your moods. And your energy yeah. levels even, you know. And so you're held yeah. hostage by your emotions more than your mind. Your mind just supports those emotions. And those emotions create your moods, which are like, if they're depression or if they're like uh, withdrawal or if they're like disengage or if they're like, um, I, I need to be more separate, you know. And, and it's an imagination that I can just be separate. Uh, we're finding that out in this world where uh, if some uh, reactors melt down, uh, there's radiation dust all over the planet. Uh, okay, so then we're saying that the internet is something different, you know, that, that now, now communication is different, but in one sense it's the same because it's uh, anxiety driven, right? In other words, uh, there's so much news and so much information uh, about all the different, let's call them hot spots, right? Uh, the, this problem, everyone's got their own favorite agenda of what's the best problem and what the prioritizing should be, right? And so then, where does public attention go? It goes to the hottest one, which means the most disaster, the most urgent, and then the ones that are even hopeless, like, okay, oil spilled in the Gulf. I mean, you can't unspill it. You can start, start cleaning it up, but you can't stop, you know, the spill has happened, you know? So then, in a way, that's hopeless as far as just uh, going into uh, resignment about how uh, we're totally screwed, you know. I mean, uh, how many uh, million uh, acre feet of water has been polluted and how many species have been wiped out and how, and how there's no oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico and it's just totally dead, <laughs> right? I mean, there's, these are all things that just build anxiety, right? Uh, like one time I was talking to some people, I'll just say one more thing to, 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 to kind of round this out. 
uh, a guy that was actually one of the best documentary uh, makers, filmmakers in Australia, and, and worked on uh, Aboriginal problems, worked on the uranium mines, worked on, uh, did some really amazing things. And I asked him, did it make any difference, right? I mean, uh, now people know about it at least. But it, actually what it did was build, build anxiety and, uh, and not offer a solution because uh, it, it, it pitted us against big business and government interests and corruption. And it just said, this is hopeless, you know, and all, all politicians are corrupt and uh, nobody's looking out for the land. And uh, in the end, it just made people want to isolate more and, and kind of go into their shell. So that the anxiety level is somehow, and the openness, you know, and the closeness. This, these are the equations that I think we have to talk about, and these are the, the uh, parameters of an effective leader, because if a leader can open your heart and say, yes, uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, even if, it, even if things crash as we're going through, right? Still, we're going to uh, be as effective as we can under the circumstances, right up to the, uh, what do you call it, the precipice where we fall over. Uh, let's just keep being effective. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I see as uh, uh, a challenge, even for the Internet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, the, the thing about what you just said it, uh, for me is when you say, the way people are going to be affected uh, affected by things and that they could fall into resignation and, and uh, experience even more anxiety. I think the key, first of all, I think that's the challenge. That's the challenge uh, in terms of what's possible. What's possible that would allow people not to be run by those things? Because when you say that, the question that arises for me, whether we're talking about people in general or my own experience, you know, which is the, the, my laboratory, uh, is that I have recognized for myself that, um, that there is a, an identity that's running the show where those uh, uh, aspects of my experience, the thoughts I have, the feelings I have, you know, uh, my perceptions of things that, uh, are frightening to me, thoughts about the future, thoughts about the past, that this is kind of the, the container, the box, the, the prison in which I live. And, and, and what I have found to be the case for myself is that's not all there is. Um, that whether you talk about this in terms of spiritual uh, uh, traditions and spiritual ways of approaching it, uh, which I don't think are relevant anymore today, given uh, what we need to do, because they haven't worked. You know, that's one thing that I think is important for people to look at. You know, they haven't made the difference. The world is still going in a bad way, uh, and most people are still suffering uh, with the experience that they have of themselves in their life. And what I have found to be the case, especially in working with thousands of people individually in psychotherapy, when I talk to people, it's clear to me that something's running the show, that, there, that the, the processes that occur in their mind, even if we talk about it in terms of uh, the new brain science that's out there, uh, that something's running the show other than who they actually are, uh, that the what's being who's being affected and uh, is this co concept that people have of themselves and that they're really almost in a hypnotic state in regard to that concept that they have of themselves. So if I talk to you right now and you tell me what you're thinking, you tell me what you're seeing, the question is, uh, are those thoughts that are occurring to you that you consider to be yours uh, are the perceptions you're having perceptions that are appearing to you that you consider to be your own, or are they being given to you by your past experience, by a context of fear that you are living in, or, or some context that you're living in? And if that's the case, and there is another possibility for you in terms of your experience that's not run by that concept of you, then there's some freedom, there's a clearing to see things that would otherwise not be seen. There's a clearing to generate new possibilities and new conversations and new language uh, that I think if the right leadership showed up could present to people and people would hear that because it speaks to 
their suffering. It's, it speaks to what's really important to them. For example, you know, people suffer because of the, the lack of quality in the relationships, the, how dysfunctional the relationships are. The more, most marriages fail, you know, statistically, and then there's probably another percentage of the people that stay together that are miserable. Uh, people have difficulty working together. People have uh, difficulty dealing with their differences as far as the, uh, their political beliefs or their religious beliefs and, and so forth and so on. So that's where people are living their lives. And, you know, it's not a pretty picture. I think everybody, as things occur like they have been occurring with the financial crisis and all the other bad news that constantly uh, comes across on the television and so forth. And then, and then in between the bad news, there's commercials for medication, you know, to... <laughs> it's uh, beautiful, all right, you know, like, uh, I mean, how can uh, we know, really, if, I mean, uh, I guess we have to admit that everything we see is filtered uh, by our experiences, you know, I don't see how you could say uh, there's an end point and now I'm clear and uh, nothing more is filtered, you know, I suppose some people say that so much drops away that there's really nothing there and, and it couldn't, it doesn't seem like there's much of a filter left. I, I don't know if that's a testimony or not, but... Let's assume that uh, whatever we see is going to be filtered and, and, uh, and maybe we can have a, uh, our clarity can grow, right? Somehow it, our filter can shrink, let's say, or we can find that uh, all those fears are not so important anymore uh, and with, another, with another point of view. Uh, as far as having a leader, I'm not, I wasn't so sure where you were going when you said if, a, if the right kind of leader could come and then talking about first people's relationships, I suppose we can have guidance and on how to relate too, right? I mean, but somehow, personally, we have to uh, uh, look inside and decide what we want to do, how we want to change ourselves, and maybe a, a, a leadership or, or some kind of in institution or organization can have a, uh, uh, how we treat ourselves and how we look at ourselves uh, uh, as a part of, of the agenda, right? And so that our, our members can, I suppose it's, uh, plenty of them have tried it. I don't, I don't know how much you can afford to do that, but, uh, uh, right, we have to have clear thinking in order to, uh, uh, uh get new ideas and, 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 uh, and new vistas. Yeah, well, the, the kind of leadership that I'm talking about is leadership that is committed to having people, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit at other times, you and I, about this business of looking at yourself and John Sherman's work and so forth. Um, I think the the new kind of leadership that we ha uh, need is leadership that talks to people about the importance of distinguishing their inner, their interior world in such a way that they can be aware of it so that it isn't running the show and, and so they can be aware of it in a way where they recognize, for example, that the thoughts that occur for them uh, are not thoughts that they're thinking. They don't know what they're going to think. This is a very simple thing that I think really is, uh, demonstrates what I'm talking about. It's pretty common, and in the conversation that we're having right now, you, you, you talk about, you know, people thinking for themselves and people thinking about, you know, what they're, what they're willing to do and so forth, evaluating things. And uh, the reality of it is, if you look at your own experience of thinking, the reality of it is that while we commonly operate as though the thoughts that occur in our head are us thinking those thoughts, the reality of it when you simply look at it for yourself is that that simply can't be the case. And I say that because if it was the case, you'd, you could control what that voice in your head is saying uh, that we call thinking, that people call thinking. And the, and the reality of it is you can't control what it's saying. It says many things that you don't like to uh, think, you know, about yourself. It says many things that you can't stop it from saying. It keeps you awake at night when you would like it to stop talking. Uh, so the evidence is pretty clear when you look that this voice in our heads that we have typically called me thinking is not, is not me. It's, we're not the source of those thoughts. And therefore, thoughts are occurring in our mind that people bleed to be their own thoughts and follow up with actions 
that continue the behaviors that are dysfunctional, that continue the unworkability in their lives, and uh, they end up with this sense of misery and hopelessness in terms of how do I get out of this mess? So anyhow, that that, well, what we can do is like we can uh, coin a term called the collective consciousness, right? And just we'll, if we need to say where it came from, you know, and it's kind of like a uh, resonance or it's an imitation, right? Because we're imitating the vibration of others because it's so easy to be loving to another, another loving person and it's so easy to feel like you got to teach a lesson to someone that uh, confronts you. And uh, so then what we're saying is uh, if, there, if many of our thoughts are collective consciousness, then we can depersonalize uh, the thoughts coming into us and we can actually uh, depersonalize the thoughts leaving from us. And then we can just kind of look at it from a uh, uh, more detached or uh, you know neutral place where the emotions don't fire so much and just try to uh, uh, see it uh, for what it is and I mean I, we could we could even develop a theory that if it's a collective consciousness that and if were, we're resonating with it then other people are resonating with us and uh, if we could somehow uh, overcome uh, some of these behavior patterns, uh, it, it should be a plus to everyone around us. And uh, it should, well, should be healing. We sh uh, our presence should be healing. Well, it's not, see, I, my experience has been that you really have to take on uh, the technology of your own mind in terms of making distinctions about what's occurring there. And I, while I think it's true that there is a collective consciousness that has uh, that keeps kind of the hypnotic state going or has an, an effect an effect on our consciousness uh, the, the 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 most significant source of what occurs in terms of what shows up in thoughts and feelings and perceptions and memories and so forth uh, is our own personal past uh, this has been seen to be the case in in the brain science that exists now in terms of the area in the brain called the amygdala and that the uh, fibers that come from the eyes and the, uh, the paths that uh, come from the eyes to carry electrical impulses to the brain um, go, many, many more of them go to that area, which is the area where past memories and emotional impressions uh, exist, then go to the prefrontal cortex, which is the area where we're present to what's going on currently around us. So our brain is, is even has even got gotten organized that way, uh, and it uh, it's it, so the past is really the place where uh, the thinking comes from. And people who have studied this also realize that the way it's organized is for survival, which is understandable, or we wouldn't be here. You know, our behavior has to be survival oriented for us to be here. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it's the survival, there's a, it's kind of the programming that runs the mind. It's survival of the being, and we consider our body to be our being, kind of the piece on the board, uh, in the board game of life, right? But it's also not conscious. Uh, it's, it's, a, an organ, it's an organ that's functioning based on conditioning, based on identification with what we consider to be us. So it's the survival of the being, but the tricky part of the program is survival of the being or whatever the being considers itself to be. Therefore, the identities that you take on in life are what the brain and what your conditioning and what the thought patterns you have are and the feeling states that you're in all, all of that is uh, working to have you survive as an identity, not survive as who you actually are, but who you have conceived yourself to be. Many, so, people, many people have testified that, uh, that you can actually see yourself in, an, in another way. I mean, that's all enlightenment experiences. When you hear a story of an enlightenment experience, somehow there was a clear scene that, hey, I'm not all this other stuff, you know, and then somehow you have this clear scene that I'm, I'm, just, I'm just this presence that, that, that can witness everything or whatever it could be, let's say it's that, you know. 
And uh, it's true, okay, like uh, that's a testimony, but uh, nobody's, like you said in, earlier, that the spiritual speak has never really been effective in transmitting that, right? It happens when it happens, and it doesn't happen when it doesn't happen. And people could say, oh, yeah, meditate, do this kind of practice, do this breathing, try Kundalini, do this and that and the other, bring your energy up, all these kind of things where you're supposedly going to have one of these experiences, right? And I can even give you some ideas of, uh, of what awakening is, right? But in the people we're going to be talking to is like the world at large. Uh, we're not going to be able to say that they're going to be able to... Uh, uh, all of a sudden realize that there's some other presence. I mean, uh, John Sherman uh, part uh, is saying that it can happen, right? And it mm -hmm. happens at its own rate. Uh, okay, well, uh, we're, you're saying the, uh, we're at the effect of the amygdala, and the amygdala is trying to tell us that we need to survive, and then uh, somehow we've got a wrong connection where we think that survival means some, this, that, and the other, be aggressive toward these other guys, you know, but I would... I wonder, I mean, the amygdala is just doing its job, you know. Where are we getting the idea that we need to be nervous and anxious and, and scared? We're getting it from our parents, our family, and our culture, aren't we? I mean, uh, don't we, uh, as, don't infants imitate, and that's like 70 or 80 or 90 percent of their learning is imitating, and I don't just mean monkey see, monkey do as far as doing things and picking up things and grasping things. I mean also in like uh, how to treat another person, you know, how to be open-hearted, how to be closed down, how oh, when somebody confronts you verbally to just shut the shades down, you know. Whatever your parents did, whatever your, your society did, what, however the kids did bullying in, in your school, you know, all that stuff's in the air, it's in the vibrations, it's in the mother's womb. I mean, I don't think you can say that just a brain is doing this to us. It's not, and, and we talked about depersonalizing, we talked about... Uh, 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 you know, the culture, the consciousness of collective co consciousness. And I think that's your mothers, uh, your fathers, your grandmothers, uh, uh, you know, uh, your forebears, uh, uh, the, the, the lands that you came from. Uh, if you're of European extraction, and uh, my mother's from uh, uh, Hungarian uh, or, or Czechoslovakia or something, however they were there, I mean, the Balkans are a real melt a stirring pot. I mean, there's some really heavy-duty stuff going on in the Balkans, and, and some of that's in me, just in her vibration, you know, and I don't want to make it cosmic and say vibration and hocus-pocus. But let's just say we don't know if it's a brain, you know, and the brain is, fought, is, fought, is following that, uh, uh, those orders, you know. We give the orders, whoever we is. It, you, you said, that, and Sherman says, that it's not what you think, you know. We're here, and, you know, we do exist, but it's not the way you think it is, right? Because there is a clear scene where Somehow you don't have to uh, execute all those uh, old, old-fashioned programs. Well, what I'm saying, Richard, is that it's not, it's not only not what you think, but thinking is thinking you. And if thinking is thinking you, and everything that you just said is r rational and reasonable and intelligent in terms of explaining things, right, explaining the way things are, and yes, obviously, the brain's a conditioned organ, right, that's having us survive according to the data that's put into it, right? Uh, but let me say this to you. In terms of the kind of leadership that I'm talking about we need and the new kind of conversation and the new science we need, right, that can get through to people by beginning to talk to them about where they are so that, you're, that you have your, their attention, and talking to them about real possibilities for a different experience of themselves in their life, and then educating them to what this new science and technology provides as far as them being able to make distinctions about their internal experience. But that new leadership is going to, is up against what you just got done saying, and the way that that shows up for me is that you're saying the world's flat. Now, if we go back to when that was something everybody knew was true, right, that the world was flat, there was a time when everybody knew that was true. It was true because if you went and you looked at the horizon, you know, it appeared that. That's the way it appeared to people. So that's, you know, that was all they needed to do was trust what they were actually seeing. In the same way, if we look at what's going on today, the way you just described it, you could argue that, well, that's what I'm actually seeing, just like people did when they said the world was flat. But we found out that there are things that we don't know 
that we don't know. That's opening up another world of possibility now. And there is technology that has been, has been being developed. And the technology that's being developed is related to the work that I shared with you that I did in the last uh, couple of weeks up at Dartmouth College. Uh, that work that was developed and is being developed by people who have been in powerful leadership positions, recognized that they were dysfunctional, that they weren't making any difference, that it was more of the same, uh, and got together and started to work on the possibility of there being a different kind of leadership that offered something to people that was actually what it is to experience being a leader, not ideas about leadership. And uh, one of the key people who created this technology is Werner Erhardt, uh, and he is a controversial figure because of some of his own experiences and difficulties in his own life. But I think when it's all said and done, if we make it through this era, that he will be recognized as somebody who is a pioneer in creating a new language in which we can distinguish aspects of our, of our experience in such a way that it's possible for us to actually lead our own lives, not be run by the thoughts that occur in our minds, not be run by the past, not be run by the environment that we're in or the conditioning that we had, but what it takes in order to do that is to look into this work that's being done now. And it's been, it's been work being worked on for about 10 years now. I'm very, very up. curious about it, you know, and it's, it's really yeah. exciting, you know. And, and a couple of things you said, you know, first of all, uh, you, you said ideas about leadership. And I think we ought to investigate ideas about leadership because that the people who we're talking to, uh, and including us, we all have ideas about leadership. And then you said it makes it possible for you to lead your own life, right? And so yeah. then I think that's the idea about leadership, especially in the States and especially in the West. Uh, we're such hero worshipers, and, and a leader is that other guy, him, them, those other guys are going to do it for us. And that leaders have to make us, everyone's got to be a leader uh, or it's not going to work. You know, you have to lead yeah. your own life, like you said. And if a leader can have us lead our own life, and uh, I took S back in the 80s. So I missed the 70s, I guess, when it was started. <laughs> but I mean, uh, at that time, you know, Werner was a leader, but he was a leader in the old school where everybody thought he was a hero, you know, according to hero worship, right? All our sports have heroes. We don't look at the teamwork. We look at the guy that can shoot the most hoops. We look at the guy that catches the most touchdown passes or throws the most touchdown passes. I mean, we're all looking for a hero, right? And, uh, and we're looking for a president that's going to pull us out of uh, some kind of disaster. I mean, and this kind of leadership, the, the, uh, this is how leaders are received. This is how leaders can get their power because a leader can't just go up and, be a, and, 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 uh, and take control of a, of, a, of a nation. I mean, all the leaders and all the despots and, and uh, and all the Middle East or you know, Saddam Hussein's and stuff, every one of them is looking over their shoulder and saying, who's following me? You know, I'm going to go in the direction of the mob. And uh, they're leading the way they, they know that, you know, they're not leading. And even the President Obama is leading the way people are going to follow him and the way he can have where everyone's not going to shun him, right? Even you, when you were the leader of a prison, you, in a way, you tried to go uh, off the beaten path. And, and uh, as I understand from your interview with Rick Archer, that... Uh, it, it was a disaster. You couldn't lead it. That you couldn't lead there. You know, you uh, smart leaders going to have to go where people are going to go. They, and uh, so the leadership we're talking about. I mean, people are going to go because they're looking for a hero, right? And they're looking for to them, to most of the people, leadership means some some superhuman that's going to solve all our problems and that's going to put everybody in line. And we can just sit back on our couch and watch the news and and say, yep, he's doing good. Yep, yep, there he goes again. And I don't know, the key to me is when you said lead your own life, you know, let, every one of us is a leader, right? Well, uh, no, I don't think, I think most, not, I think the majority of us aren't leaders. It goes back to what I said before. If your thoughts are thinking you, where's, where, where what, who's, what's leading? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? But I mean, we have and to so, be a leader. We have to be a leader. And we have to realize yes. that those thoughts are, are not our thoughts and depersonalize uh, what's happening in our life and run our life as some kind of an experiment to, 
to prove our leadership to ourselves and to, to those that we love, you know, uh, that we can lead a happy life and that we can lead a life that uh, is serving and, and, and supporting other people and not tearing them down, right? We find ourselves tearing people down all over the, uh, every day, right? Because we're saying the guy drove wrong, he got in front of me, he didn't respect the rules and I did. I mean, we're comparing ourselves so we're, and we're really tearing down everybody just as much as we're building people up. And a leader, to me, is someone that builds everything up and always is life affirmative, you know, life affirmative and not life negating. And uh, how does that, does Werner, you know, how, has Werner solved that one? Yes, I think he has, actually. And, and, and I'll tell you something, you know, you made reference to my uh, alleged leadership in the prison. And uh, my experience was that I was an effective leader, and that I I did it, I did uh, I I did uh, experience leadership, and I and the the thing about it is, if it's a flat world, and you start going around talking about that it's it, it's the world's not flat, it's round, you're going to run into some problems in the beginning. A lot of people are going to be unhappy about hearing that because it's going to change a lot of things that people have investments in. So when I was the leader at the prison, uh, I was uh, uh, expressing leadership, an authentic form of leadership. And when you do that, you can expect to be at risk because, uh, you know, you're uh, talking about a different way of uh, doing business and you're empowering individual people. And when that occurs, given the world we live in, there are people who feel threatened by that. The kind of leadership I'm talking about, Richard, is the kind of leadership that got demonstrated when somebody went up to the Berlin Wall with a hammer and started to break it down. One individual. Uh, uh, it's ordinary people that are, that are heroic in terms of their willingness to, to uh, give themselves to something greater than themselves, their willingness to uh, be committed to authenticity their willingness to do what it takes to develop a consistent awareness and learn the technology and the distinctions to know what's going on in your own mind so it's not running you, so that there is a new possibility for you to create a different future for yourself to live into. And this is the kind of work that Werner's been doing and language that Werner's been creating along now with some other very powerful uh, leaders in the world it's an ontological model of leadership. Let's and, just say and, to everyone what ontological means. Does that mean just kind of looking at yourself or? or? No, ontology is the, the science of being. So in terms of leadership, an ontological model of leadership is a model that speaks to what it is to be a leader, to experience leadership, not what qualities does a leader have or you're a leader because you were put in a position of being a leader, or you have authority, or you have force that you can use for leadership, or that you can play on people's needs and minds and play on people's uh, desire to have uh, relief and have a better world the way most politicians do in our so-called democracy. And then there are other places where leadership is obtained if you want to call it leadership, it's really dictatorship where people uh, just don't question the authority because of the force that's behind it and the consequences of doing that. We're seeing that in Syria right now. So uh, it's, a, it's a new model of leadership that has to do with the being a leader uh, not being in the role of a leader, right. but actually... But where is that perception? I mean, is that in the perception of the leader? The leader might just be a leader, right? And a certain amount of people are following and a certain amount aren't. And those that are following, are, 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 are many of them, most of them, are perceiving some advantage to them, right? Because these priorities are my priorities, right? And somehow uh, a flow of goods and services comes to me. And, uh, and the ones that aren't following them are saying, well, these are not my priorities, and actually all the flow of my good, there's no goods coming to me. I don't even have a job, so I have no goods. And uh, so then uh, what's wrong with this picture, right? And so mm -hmm. then I don't understand what being a leader, you know, being a leader just means, okay, here you are, and people are following you, right? If nobody follows you, you're not a leader, right? I mean, uh, well, 
being a leader and and what I you know I think when you get into some of the material that that I I shared with you about the details of this work, you'll start to see more clearly what I'm talking about. Uh, and in, what I'm talking about is being a leader. Part of being a leader in terms of authenticity and in terms of being committed to something greater to yourself, like other people's needs and other people's experience of life in themselves, uh, is to educate people about what's running their life and to uh, become masterful with the language necessary and the speaking that's necessary to, so that people are aware of the fact that you are speaking directly to their needs and their wants and their conditions in terms of the fact that if you uh, apply the technology to yourself, if you do the work and you take it seriously, and this is not a spiritual matter, this is, this is really technology that has to do with dealing with the experiences that you have uh, and being aware of the fact that you're, you are greater than the, uh, in the experiences that you have in your head that who you are is greater than that, you know, I mean, if you can, if you can see the aspects of experience that occur in your mind, for example, and in your body, if you can see that, then you must not be that. You, there has to be distance. Right, I mean, that's a logical yeah. deduction, right? So then uh, it's not really, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you can make that logic and then somehow your old programs that still have you in a kind of a re resigned mood uh, might still be operating, right? In fact, they probably are, right? All your old uh, programs are still operating, even though you, you see, I mean, I, mean, I can see uh, for how long I've seen that uh, aggression doesn't work, but still aggressiveness comes up, right? And uh, yeah. you could be so clear in your head, but how does that become a felt sense, you know? When you're talking about a leader, okay, now when I'm thinking of a leader, I'm thinking of a corporate leader or a, or a political leader, and they've got a company to run, and they've got a nation to protect, and uh, to stimulate the economy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and and uh, whether they can exp inspire men as a part of that, I mean, they have to inspire people as a part of it, but I mean, they have to get a lot of things done to run the corporation or to, or to follow corporate goals, right? And sometimes when you're speaking of leadership, it sounds like a leader in a, in a self-improvement course or like in a, that's totally dedicated to inspiring men and, and to changing how they think about themselves. And that's, that's another kind of a leader that has that luxury to just uh, uh, look inward and, uh, you know, uh, examine and, uh, and see and uh, uh, inquire about uh, what really makes my life tick. And uh, is there a distinction between those kinds of, le uh, is that a, a distinction that I've drawn in, in leadership? I mean, does everybody have the luxury that they can uh, 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 give that much time to inspiration? Well. I don't think it's a matter of luxury. I, I think there's, that it's a matter of necessity the, in the sense that um, whether we're talking about the conditions that exist in the world in general, the conditions that exist in one's personal life, or the conditions that exist that affect business, it really, in the, the type of leadership I'm talking about, applies to all of these areas. It's interesting that this technology that I'm referring to, uh, where it has been uh, picked up on and where it, uh, 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 it's being used right now uh, is in the business world because the people in the business world, as you said, are, uh, they have to be profitable. They have to deal with competition. They have to deal with circumstances effectively. They have to deal with people and, and having people uh, do effective work and so forth. Uh, and this technology really uh, is all about effectiveness, and that effectiveness can be uh, used to deal with whatever situation there is that you're dealing with that you want to be more effective with, whether it's your own relationship with your wife, your family, your own relationship with yourself, the way that you run a business, the way that you run a country. And uh, it really has a basis to it when you begin to step back and look at what it's all about it has a base, basis to it that really is making a statement, and the statement is that there's a possibility that the world can work. There's a possibility that the world can work for everyone with no one left out. And I think if there are leaders that start to come out of this technology and start to develop the conversations that uh, it would take for 
the common people, everyone, regardless of what religion you're in, uh, what you've experienced previously, uh, if, if this new leadership starts to come into play, and these leaders, be, and they don't have to be in charge to be leaders. They don't have to be somebody who's been voted in to be a leader. They could be somebody who starts to say things to people that are powerful, that touch, move, and inspire people, that people see the possibilities that they're talking about. They start to recognize the power and the value of the technology that's being spoken so of. So they, they could be opinion leaders. Well, I don't think so much uh, 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 opinion because we both know that uh, opinions don't make much of a difference in the world. So it's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of saying to somebody the way I just did to you, that if you, if you start to do an inquiry and an examination of your own internal experiences in terms of your thoughts and your feelings and, you know, and recognize that you're not running your own show, you know, that, ought to, that in itself ought to get your attention. And then if somebody talks to you about the possibility that that doesn't have to be the case. That you can run your own show. That you can run your own show. And there's actual technology that distinguishes the way to go about running your own show in terms of recognizing the context in which you're functioning, recognizing where your thoughts are coming from, recognizing what it would take to be able to have a future that you can live into effectively and cause that future to occur. One of the things that comes out of this te technology that's interesting is that the, for most people, their future will be another version of their past. Uh, and if you study people the way I have, you see that that ends up being the case. For example, if you just look at relationships, it's almost common knowledge now that people who have issues about relationships and end up getting divorced because they uh, figure that it was just a mistake and then they find somebody who's completely different and they think this one's going to work but before long they find out that it just looks different and after the honeymoon right, settled right, down course. they're back in trouble. Right. So that's an Well, I mean, uh, okay, uh, we've talked about leadership and a new kind of leadership, and we've talked about a technology, and it's kind of like my fault because I didn't allow myself enough time to go over some of the material or even get a quick look at, it, at some of the material you, you, you keyed me into. And so then, I don't know, I mean, uh, maybe this is a future discussion after I get a little bit more prepared, but I mean, when we talk about the technolo this technology, can we let the cat out of the bag on any of these things? or? In other words, like, okay, you said most people are going to have a, a future that's some version of their past. Okay, well, uh, Werner has always projected himself into a new thinker and a leader of, uh, of, of men, you know, as far as uh, uh, new thought and, and workshops, and he's still doing it. So then his future is uh, some version of his past. And, uh, and so then, okay, big deal, you know. So then uh, we all, we carry a certain amount of baggage, right? The only person that I know that's not, you know, their future's not have, doesn't have to do with their past is the guy that got Lou Gehrig's disease or something, and he, and his past, you know, is gone, and he's just dying, right? And, uh, uh, and so that's a whole new experience for him, right? Uh, uh, it doesn't take more than a year or so to go down that path. But, I mean, uh, so then what, you know, what should we say about some of this technology? I mean, is it, is it timely to, to, to share some of this stuff or, or examine it, or, or should we just, uh, or should this be future when I've uh, studied a little bit more about it? Well, I can try to talk a little bit about it, but it really involves a commitment to, first of all, getting the possibility that it is uh, just, I mean, to the idea that, for example, in the work that I did recently, the way the work was presented was the difference between this course on leadership and other courses on leadership is that the promise of the course is that by the end of the course, you will be a leader and be able to express leadership uh, as a natural aspect of who you are. So that's ontological. That's being yeah. a leader. and. Uh, by the way, you mentioned that uh, Werner is subject to his past, uh, just like everyone else, and he's still doing what he was doing in the past. That's actually not the case. You know, uh, Werner Earhart was, uh, his reputation was completely destroyed by allegations uh, made against him by people in the media 
uh, that uh, turned out to be false. But as you well know, once the, uh, a, a war is waged against you in the public uh, arena, uh, it can be too late to save yourself in terms of your reputation, especially if it's waged by people that uh, the public listens to. So his whole life changed, and he had to really walk away from what he was doing. Uh, and for many years, he did his work in private. It's only recently that he has been drawn back out by people who recognize his genius when it comes to developing this technology that allows people to get their act to get access to what uh, actually works and to become more effective in living their lives in every way. Uh, so he's he 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 is uh, not really living his past. He's really living a a, a different kind of future for himself. Yeah. Well, that distant it's, past, then let it be a distant past. But anyhow. Uh, Let's say I'm a leader, you know, I'm a natural leader, and uh, I can go into any room and probably get uh, attention turned on me, right? But the thing is, I have nothing I want to lead, right? Uh, there's nothing I want to do with that attention, and there's nothing I believe in that, that, uh, that you know, it's not that I believe I can't do something, but somehow I'm not turned on to, uh, to try to convince anyone to uh, look at the world through my eyes, right? And so then uh, I'm a very ineffective leader because I have nothing, you know, I have. So then a leader, let's just say one premise of leadership is some, uh, some kind of a belief that uh, uh, there's some kind of scene here that uh, uh, could be shared by others and, and could make them more effective in whatever they chose. And so then could that be a, a characteristic of leadership? Yeah, uh, one of the characteristics of leadership that is taught in, uh, in this technology, it's not actually a characteristic of leadership, it's an experience, uh, it's one of the aspects of experience of being a leader is, uh, is, is one of the things that it takes to be effective and to be a natural leader is to have something greater than you that you're committed to. So uh, another way of saying that to you would be if you imagine for yourself that you had the ability to lead people that you had the ability to speak to people and be listened to, and that you had the ability to uh, uh, have people be touched, moved, and inspired, and moved into action out of what you had to say, and could have an impact on huge numbers of people, and even make a difference that uh, could affect all of humanity. What would you be interested in leading? What would be your goal? Well, I mean, uh I would, my goal would be to tell people that they, 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 they can engage in their own life and be their own leader by, dis, by day to day discovery, right? Because I wouldn't say that we need a, a central idea. Uh, you know, we don't need a central workshop of ideas, you know. We need a, a central idea maybe of harmony. Uh, we need a central idea of openness and, and, and actually uh, feeling where we can feel our fellow being and, and feel it. Uh, we're not all that different, you know. Uh, we can have a different focus point where we can look at uh, what's the same about you and me instead of what's different about you and me and put our focus, and what we put our focus on will grow. I think these things are so obvious, right? But as far as saying like, uh, okay, I, I can envision a society where, where uh, everything works for every person and nobody's left out, and I probably could. Actually, I could envision a society like that. But it would have a whole different structure of ownership, you know. You wouldn't be able to own certain things. You wouldn't be able to own resources, you know. You can't own the earth because uh, uh, the earth belongs to every man that was, w was spawn spawn of, spawned of the earth, right? And the earth actually uh, belongs to every species that lives on the earth, you know. And I would say that you, you, you really can't own it and you can't rent it out and collect rents on, on, on any part of the earth. You know, because you're not, you can't have the, the resource. And you're saying, oh, no, no, the way we do it, I'm the steward. You know, I'm going to be the steward for this earth. And, I'm gonna, and then my children are going to be the steward of it afterwards. No way. You know, so all those things are erroneous, you know. Like uh, the, the accumulation of wealth is, uh, is uh, counterproductive now. It's totally counterproductive, right? That people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, wealth can be accumulated by speculation, uh, by just uh, uh, mass games of, uh, of uh, taking and, and grasping and taking. And uh, then that wealth can be uh, put in a bank and the bank can uh, open a bunch of policies to get everyone indebted to it. 
and uh, that uh, then it can, you can do a, a, a mass skimming project, you know, you can skim for the rest of your life. You know, we don't need that anymore because we can create wealth, uh, we don't need private wealth, you know. And now we have an idea that public wealth is always squandered and always mis, mis, uh, uh, mis, uh, uh, used. And uh, so then, sure, there's a lot of ways, but I mean, I c anyone can visualize something that'll work, right? But they can't visualize how to, how to put it into practice. You know, how do we get from here to there, you know? Nobody knows that, you know? Nobody even knows where we're here, where here is, right? Nobody's willing to admit it, or nobody can really have the full sight of, like, what is the total, uh, you know, uh, total state of affairs right now? How can I possibly know it, right? Well, I, uh, I, I, I assert that I know enough about it to know that it's, it's not a good situation, which is what you just got done saying in, in, in a lot of specific ways. And, uh, and, and my perception is that it, there is the technology available now uh, to know uh, what the path needs to be in order to have a different future. One of the things that is, uh, is uh, observably true is that reality is a function of agreement. You know, perceived reality, ability. perceived reality is a function of agreement. Total, uh, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. So if the conversation that new leadership generates to people that is effective and people listen to it and people do the work necessary to become leaders in their own lives and discover within themselves you know, what it would take to uh, transform their own experience as a human being and be somebody who's contributing to this new reality that's getting cre created, that as, if this reality grew and spread in terms of it becoming uh, the, as common as the world is round is now versus what everybody thought uh, when it, they thought it was flat, then that reality would have enough agreement to be the world we're living in. So uh, that's the path to get to that. Now, one of the other things that was, dis is, was discovered in this work, and by the way, the way this technology is designed is that it's not an education where you're uh, taught something or you learn something in terms of concepts or knowledge or things like that. The technology is designed to put you through an actual experience where you discover in your own experience what is being taught. So it's not something to believe in. It's not something that you practicing that's outside of yourself. There are things that are pointed to in the work necessary to get to this place of leadership that one must discover within themselves. One example of what is brought out in the course is that uh, it's important, for example, to see if we can get at uh, what it is that causes people's actions. You know, what's the source of people's actions? And uh, that's another aspect of this technology. This technology is about find, getting to the source of things and dealing with things at their source. And so one of the things that's talked about is what is the, what is the source of people's actions? And, one of the th and what's pointed to in this work is that the source of people's actions is a function, it's a correlate of the way the world occurs to them, is the source of people's actions. Now, I, 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 when I look at that in my own experience and when I look at that in relationship to the people I've worked with over, over 40 years as a psychologist, especially criminal uh, people, uh, that's pretty evident to me that uh, the... The way things occur to you, the way they show up to you, the way they appear to you is what you're dealing with and what you're relating to. And so it's directly correlated to your actions. Yeah, yeah, uh, I know. That's clear. That's clear. Okay, well, how do things appear to you? You know, how do things appear to you? Let's go down one more level. It's a story you tell yourself about things. It's all uh, verbal. It's totally verbal. Yeah, and, but, and verbal also means emotional and it means mood, you know. And, uh, yeah. and that can be just absorbed, you know, from your surroundings. And uh, yeah, so, it is a story. It can be uh, gelled to a story, though, right? Well, you see, that's the thing, Richard, that you hit the nail on the head. You said that, you know, uh, how, how do, how, what is it that has, uh, causes what, how, how things appear to somebody, how, how the world occurs to somebody. 
and you, and you you pointed directly at it. You know, it's the way they think about the world. It's the perceptions that they have of the world that are conditioned. So people are perceiving an interpretation that's conditioned of the world, and not necessarily the world. So their ineffectiveness is a function of not dealing with what's actually going on in the world, but dealing with the point of view about it or an interpretation about it that's colored by feelings and this survival mechanism that they are and this identity that they are. And so... It's also uh, colored by evidence, right? So I could say well, like, uh, uh, the world's unjust because I'm poor and I don't have a bank account and I don't even have a house and I've got one shirt and it's kind of got a hole in it. You know, and uh, okay, I is that evidence? It it appears to be evidence, right? And then somebody else will say, uh, uh, "Gee, my bank account is great, and my actually my five houses are terrific, and I'm buying another Maserati this week." And uh, what are you talking about, world crisis? I'm doing really good, see. And in a way, these two guys have opposing views, you know, right? The one guy says, "Leave it how it is," you know, and the other guy mm -hmm. says, "Come on, give me change, give me change, give me change," and so then. Mm -hmm. One of them has a lot of go power as far as, you know, hiring people, hiring promotion, running ads on TV, actually owning the TV, right? And just saying, look, this is the programming we're going to give. And then uh, actually, you know, it's kind of like an unfair, <laughs> it's an unfair war, you know, because the other guy's got no means whatsoever to even, never even try to express himself because he just thinks, oh, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I never went to school, I can't talk, I just get mad, right? And, uh, and the other guy is a polished speaker, an orator, a uh, politician, a uh, famous guy, uh, you know, he's a Hollywood star, uh, he's got millions and millions of people that are in his fan club and his Twitter and all this stuff, I mean, and then we're just saying, okay, let's make a leader where we just, uh, uh, we tell these people that, uh, you know, their perception of the world is what colors their action, and the other guy says, that's fine, I'm going to keep doing it, right? And in fact, you know, if anyone bugs me, like, too many President Obamas or something like that, I'll just put a number out on him. And like you were saying, uh, Scientologists, you could just say, if this guy had an accident, it wouldn't be all that bad, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But again, you know, what you, what you just said uh, supports my uh, assertion that uh, it does, the, uh, the, the people's behavior is correlated with their, uh, the way the world occurs for them and their perception of the world. And if it's a person who's got a lot of money and a lot of power, then the way the world occurs uh, for that person, it occurs for that person in a way that serves that person's interest and that person's purpose and so forth. Uh, but I, what I would say to that is that while that may be the case, uh, on another level, my suspicion, actually greater than a suspicion, is that these people who have that kind of power aren't necessarily happy, and that these people don't necessarily have a very good quality of life, and that they're living in fear maybe more than most other people are, Right. And intrepidation and anxiety and depression and sleeplessness and you know and so forth, and so the other thing is that they're the minority. Oh, Although yeah. they may have most of the wealth and the power, they're the minority. Yeah, they got ninety so, the ninety nine percent, right? I mean, or yeah. that one percent is no, but whatever yeah. that figure is, okay. But I mean, it's going to be a hell of a leader that's going to uh, go talk to the uh, you know the wealth in this country, and let's say it's represented by uh, three million people or something, and tell them, hey. Let's divvy up this stuff and let's uh, talk about ownership in another way. And, uh, you know, you guys can't own so much stuff, so, you know, get rid of it. You're going to have to give it, uh, give, it, give it away or get rid of it. And that, uh, you know, uh, can't you see how you're not happy? And you would be so much happier if everybody was, nobody was left out, you know, and everybody had a job. So hire everybody while you've got a company. And uh, they're going to say, sure, that's a great idea. This is a, one, a very seductive leader. I think I'll just fall right into the line, right? Yeah, well, that wouldn't be leadership. That would be stupidity. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> and so that's not what I mean by leadership. And you wouldn't go and you, uh, uh, to me, a, a true leader wouldn't do that because a true leader, one of the qualities of a true leader, going back to some of the material of this technology, is a true leader is somebody who's freed up from the constraints that had existed that from the constraints that typically exist for human beings that limit who they can be and how they can talk and what they can see for themselves as possibilities and with those constraints being freed up and one of the constraints that people have is uh what 
what's talked about in this technology is an already listening that you you know you you hear what fits what you already know right so but when you learn about these constraints it becomes possible to get access to this condition that you're living in in such a way not that you necessarily necessarily have to depersonalize or detach yourself right but it's possible to know to redirect your attention and to uh, not allow these things that occur in your internal world to dominate your experience so that you begin to get freed up to see what's actually going on around you. Uh, uh, one of the ways that I talk about this is if you see the hammer that's hitting you in the head is in your own hand, you're probably not going to keep doing that. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a natural intelligence that uh, people will respond to what they begin to see will uh, make a difference and allow them to be more effective in their life. And if it's true that it's the it's the one percent and the ninety nine percent that uh, the 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 leadership uh, is really going to be talking to the the largest group of people because we're looking to change the reality itself. If the reality changes, the people with the money will have to deal with that. It just, you know, if the wall in Berlin, when the wall in Berlin came down, that changed the situation because it wasn't there anymore. Uh, and so that's the way this, this new future will come into play. If, uh, if nobody, and this is an old saying, but still true, if nobody would go to war, how could there be a war? That's a new reality. And so I'm talking about creating a new reality and a new future. Now, one of the things that it takes in order to do that is to, uh, to get the past out of the future. And what I mean by that is most people's way of perceiving the future is given by the past. It's the only point of reference that they have to perceive the future and anticipate what might happen or to look at, you know, uh, what actions they're going to take to try and change uh, the future from the past. But like they say in that French saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's been the case for humanity. That's been the case for individuals when they attempt to change their life, even when they use spiritual approaches to do it, psychological approaches to do it, political approaches, philosophical approaches. What we're well, dealing both with psychological, is that psychological really approaches and spiritual approaches try to break that link. You know, that linkage, you know, that you just described that uh, we're constructing a future out of the past, you know, and I'd be, and so then you're saying this is not psychological and it's not spiritual. So then this is something else that's, that proposes they can break the link uh, with the past and somehow have a new idea. I mean, uh, can you share uh, how that would work or wh what's that yeah. like? Yeah, one of the things, so if it's, so if one sees for oneself that's what's determining them is the past and what's determining their ability to create the future is the past, then obviously one, uh, what they would need to do is recognize something that's very simple and obvious uh, about how that works. And how that works is that uh, people project the past into their future because it's the only reference point that they have. And this is something that's automatically occurring. It's the way the mind works. It's, sure, what, sure. it's what, you know. So, the, so what happens is by people becoming aware of this and that it doesn't work and having the distinctions to get access to it, get their hands on it, that what they can do is, first of all, have a consistent awareness that the past is in the past and whatever is not complete about the past needs to get completed so it stays in the past and doesn't keep coming up in the future, which is, which is possible to do. Yeah, that's it a technology. Possible. It could seem daunting because how, who knows how many things that we have in the past that are undone. But I guess it would be a, a, a limited amount. I mean, there must be a finite amount. But you said that uh, the past is the only reference point. So you're suggesting we move into the future or into the present with no reference point, right? Yeah, I, I'm, su I'm suggesting that if you, if you do the work necessary to have the past be finished and be in the past, and by the way, uh, one possibility is to simply, you know, you could deal with completing whatever is not complete about your own past with yourself, uh, with other people and so forth, and there are ways to do that, specific ways to do that. 
but uh, another thing that you can do if there's a lot there and you uh, don't feel that you've succeeded or that you have uh, re recognized everything that's incomplete, you can declare that, de make a declaration that your pass is complete. Now, declaration as an, an act of speech is not like an assertion. It's not based on evidence. It's a declaration like Martin Luther King de uh, made a declaration about uh, uh, people being equal when he gave his speech in Washington. So you can make a declaration that your past is complete, and if that declaration is real for you, and you, uh, and you make that declaration to you, and you make that, that declaration a reality by expressing it to other people, then you are uh, get to a place where you're free for the future. And you said that, okay, so where are we at? Where there's nothing in the present and nothing in the future? Yeah, you, yes, exactly. You get to a place where there's an open possibility, like a blank slate, where then you can generate possibilities for the future that come out of conversations like we're having right now in terms of looking to see what kind of being would it take, what kind of actions would it take, who do I need to be, what are the aspects or the qualities of being a human being that would work to have a world that works for everybody. And, uh, and, and the areas that are dealt with in this work, uh, that again, one must see for oneself, which takes something. You know, it's not just about being in the audience and listening to concepts being presented. It's about actually engaging experientially with what's being talked about and dealing with it in your own experience and in your own life to see it there for yourself directly so it's real and so that you actually have access to it. Uh, and when people do that, uh, they find out that they are not who they thought they were. Uh, the possibilities for the future become an open reality for them to create in. And they discover that the way that things get created is they get created in language. Yeah, no, so I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, that's what I'm finding in my own life, you know. I, li mm -hmm. I, I haven't really uh, practiced a declaration, you know. And, and I think you, sa you said a beautiful thing when you said, if that declaration is real for you, and somehow you can, you can uh, also express it, right? And you can mm -hmm. express it, and it gets realer and realer as you express it, really, and as people receive it, right? And then there should yes. be a technology of receiving other people, too, and, and going to those people that, that can receive you, right? In other words, you're making a, uh, not a pact, but some kind of like a, you're making a, 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 so a networking group that somehow s is supportive to e e each other, you know, because you're, you're able to share and share your declarations, right, and clear your path yes. with each other. I can see that, and then I can see what you're talking about as a point, a, a neutral point where uh, anything is possible, right? And, I, and I've done it myself. I'm, I'm, I'm right in the thick of it because I'm, I've deconstructed my, I haven't even deconstructed it. I just kind of walked away from my USA life, and I'm in Australia, and uh, like uh, I'm uh, in, it's winter down here, and uh, you know, it's not cold, but I mean, it's the winter of uh, not hibernation, but it's like the regeneration is happening, and I'm and I've got this whole space up here of of potential, right? And I can see all the images up here, and they, I can pull anyone down, and I can make a story around, and I can say, well, this would be my story today, and then I'll, that's how I'll perceive the world, right? And then and I say, no, I don't need to. I'll put that back up there, and I'll leave all those images, and I'll just uh, uh, let this be a uh, a pregnant moment where anything can happen, you know, and I can go to another country, I can go to another part of this country, I can interact with, uh, with uh, different groups here, I can go to the spiritual groups, the healing groups, the aboriginal groups, uh, go into the desert experiences, go into the mystic, uh, the Ularus and, the, and uh, you know, the mystical uh, energy spots in Austra Australia is a, an amazing, amazing place. And, uh, or I can stay right here and just be in winter, you know, and uh, and I can do that, you know, and the only thing I don't do is like I don't have an idea or whatever you called it, let's see, like uh, that I can get behind and feel like this is what I want to, sure, my skills are I can make a movie, you know, I can tell a story, you know, and I can tell uh, many people's stories and just say, well, let's get along with this group, let's get along with that man, let's get along, hey, let's respect this person, hey, here's a person of a different color, a different creed, a different uh, economic group, you know, let's respect them, right? And uh, just see that, get, walk in his shoes for a while, and I can tell those stories. I can have a dialogue with you and with others, you know, but to have that one idea that I think I need to go out and, and, and put all my salesmanship behind, and I can, I can sell too. I'm a pretty good, 
uh, I've got a pretty good line and do a pretty good dog and pony show. And mm -hmm. uh, even though I've never led groups, really, uh, you know, and uh, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can command attention, but I've never chosen to really uh, uh, set myself up as a teacher. I think it's dangerous, and I really don't want to do that in this time. Dangerous in the sense that then I have to grab a few of these images, and then all of a sudden a whole life constructs out of those things, and then all the web of, of what I got to do and what I don't have to do constructs, and I'm in just enjoying this moment too much, I tell you. <laughs> I'm just uh, enjoying this creative moment. And, uh, and so then that's what's happening with me. I'm your, I'm your man. <laughs> I, I, and I can, I can really totally, uh, I can tell you what will work. I mean, uh, in many, many ways. And, and, and one thing that has to work is whatever works has to be compatible with what's going on now. Because there's never going to be a flip-flop. You know, I mean, there, a lot of things are going to crash and crumble. And that's not a flip-flop. That's just chaos, right? And so, so if so, I see that what has to happen is that a model has to be created, many models, right? And we have to learn from those models and they have to be small scale. There's no way that a leader is going to be United States of America or the Federation of Europe or the Soviet and X's and the China's and stuff. They're, you know, they can push things through, but they're not really going to be grassroots things that have the hearts and, and minds of people behind them, right? And somehow mm -hmm. there's going to have to be some small models, some small nations, some communities or something that do things different, that have come different institutions. I just came out of New Zealand, and New Zealand is a terrific possibility, you know, and especially around Christchurch, where the, all the earthquakes were, see? Mm -hmm. And the insurance companies are all waffling, saying, well, it's still on stable ground. We're not going to pay. <laughs> and even if we paid, we're not going to reinsure your building, so you can't have any mortgages. You know, you're out, you're out, you know? And this is the mm -hmm. perfect time for people to come together as a community Say, well, let's have our own bank. Let's have our own credit union, you know. Why do we have to have Australian banks that run New Zealand, right? Why don't we just uh, count on ourselves and, and have a new local uh, connection with each other and not those guys and those leaders and the leaders have to do it and they, it's their fault. They're polluting this and they're doing this, you know. What am I doing, you know? And what's going to get people, the leadership that, that I see that needs to happen is what's going to get people to be proactive in their own lives and, and proactive with their own neighbors, right? Because it's the neighbors mm -hmm. that we fight with the most, right? And we think, oh, mm -hmm. we can work for world peace, but we can't have peace in our own damn family, right? And so mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's clear where you got to lead, but you don't, leadership to me is not any big and grandiose thing that's going to uh, change the world, you know? It's got to change just each one of us, you know, whether it has to go one at a time or 10 at a time or how many of our people, 100 can be in one of these these, uh, t these groups that you're talking about, uh, seminars with Werner, uh, what can happen? I don't know. Well, I'm not, I don't have any, uh, you know, I actually have no vested interest in Werner or his, uh, or his seminars with Werner, but I do have a vested interest in the technology that he's been a part of creating because I can see its power, and I think you will too when you get into it a little bit. Uh, and, and I think that uh, one of the things that can make a difference See, you know, Richard, you know, if we really look at it, the reality, one of the realities that needs to be seen for us to kind of uh, become effective, you know, and stop repeating what doesn't work, is that talking doesn't make any difference. Well, I mean, no talking means, doesn't make any difference either. That's true. That's true. So, what, so, we, so one of the things that we want to uh, d discover for ourselves is what does make a difference so that we have, at least we have that, that, you know, uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's one of those things when you do the inquiry, when you do the work, what becomes obvious is that the only thing that actually makes a difference is action. Is I don't action. think action makes a difference either because mindless action is all over the world. I mean, there's no well, place in the world where action's not happening, you know, and it's not making a difference what, uh, at all. You know, I well, think the I, only thing that makes a difference is, is open-heartedness, groundedness, so you can feel the other person, which causes open-heartedness, and the balancing of your thoughts with your feelings, so that you can feel a man, and so that you know what you do to that man is important, right? And how you treat him is important. And that's the only thing that can make a difference, is balancing our thoughts and our feelings. And we have to do that by working on what's weak, you know, what we're weak in. If we're a thinking person, we have to ground ourselves, take a deep breath, and be able to feel our neighbor, right? And if we're just a feeling person where we're going up and down like a roller coaster and now it's great and now it's awful and we don't know why or where, uh, wherefore, 
we have to start verbalizing and, and creating a conversation that, that has some sense and, and says, well, well, how did we even get here? And do this inquiry you're talking about. And, uh, and, uh, and see, well, I mean, uh, what is the conversation that's put me here, you know? And it, whether it's a conscious conversation, of course, 99% are unconscious. I mean, we don't know how many percent, we don't know the size of the unconscious because it's unconscious, right? <laughs> and so it could be, it's more than an iceberg, you know, underwater. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, uh, we don't, and we don't know what part of, uh, uh, of our uh, behaviors and the, and, the, and the drama of mankind, we don't know what part of that is, is, is collective conditioning. Uh, maybe it's 99.99999%. Maybe there's nothing personal. Really, who knows what we, we can do by ourselves. And the discovery to me is just to uh, feel it, you know, feel it and verbalize it. And those are the two components. And then when those are in harmony, I think action will be, will be beautiful and will totally make a difference. Well, first of all, when you said earlier that action doesn't make a difference, there's plenty of action and it's, it's, you know, it's negative. Well, I didn't say any kind of action. When I said action is the only thing that makes a difference. Um, it is the only thing that makes a difference, but not just any action. Effective action makes a difference, and action that's coming from a person who is uh, freed up from the constraints that have the action not be effective or have the action be uh, self-centered or, you know, uh, all of the other ways that people behave that are destructive and ineffective. And it comes back to what I'm talking about here. In order for that to be the case, a person would have to do the work to educate themselves about what has taken them over and cause them to become so mechanical and uh, cause them to become a detriment to themselves. You know, that's the condition that most of us live in, that we're a detriment to ourselves. We can't act on our own yeah, best interests. Yeah, we're interest. our worst enemy, right? Yeah. And so on a, ma on a massive scale, that's also the case, you know, that as, as, uh, as groups of people, uh, we're unable to act on our own best interest. So, uh, I think that one of the things, and you'll see this when you look at some of the material, that can make a, a dramatic change in a short period of time is a shift in context. Context is a very interesting abstraction to study and to become familiar with and to see the power of. Uh, context literally can be what uh, causes how people perceive things. Uh, and a shift in context could have a dramatic effect on the way things occur for people. Mm -hmm. uh, an example that's given in this work that I did in the last few weeks is there, uh, there was, and this is an actual true example, that there was a violinist that was playing uh, on the street and uh, with his violin case open, and uh, he was playing uh, a very famous piece of, uh, classical music on the violin and the violin was a Stradivarius and uh, he was playing it very masterfully people walked by many people didn't notice him at all a few people tossed a coin in his uh, violin case and uh, so that was the reality uh, that same person the following Saturday night appeared uh, at a concert hall and he, he was, turned out to be the most famous a, guy of all, right? <laughs> that's right. He turned out to be one of the greatest violinists in the world. And he was playing the same Stradivarius, the same music, and people were paying huge amounts of money yeah, to right. get there and well, get there. Well, you got to know your here. audience, right? And he was just having a good time on the street corner in the subway or something like that. No, I no, think no, no, cool, no. The, the point is that the context changed. Absolutely. Context, but we're all in a context, you know, and that context is what you said from the very beginning, our perceived sense of uh, our reality or our perceived sense of, and that's our context. And then we have to perceive a new, a new sense of reality to have a new context. I don't think anyone can give us a new context, you know, and somehow he was in some sense of his life, he was already perceived as a, as a master violinist or otherwise he wouldn't have got on the stage of the, of the Madison Square Garden, right? Yeah, but the way he was perceived by other people was totally different, and that's the point. That's the power of context. Yeah. And my experience has been, and what's, what is uh, uh, part of this technology, is that, in fact, we can create context. In fact, we do create context. In fact, uh, that 
you could say that who you are ultimately is a context uh, that has a lot uh, to do with what determining how things appear for you in life. So one of the things that have you could say that one of the things that happens for people that experience a profound transformation or an enlightenment or whatever word you want to use is that there is a shift in their context. Yeah, and well, so their old they, context broke, you know, and, and it takes usually a, a little while for if that new one comes in, but the new one is going to be wider, right? And so then, I mean, uh, yeah, a shift in context is, uh, is what changes things. And what, one of the things that is... And it's a story, a right? It's a story. It's a, it's a verbalization. It's, it's created by a verbalization, right? Well, the, the, it's, it's actually not a story. Context is kind of that, that which shapes what appears within it. So uh, if, you, uh, if you create a context of openness, if you create a context of equality, if you, uh, uh, that it, and see, the thing about this... Well, openness and equality are verbal, right? That's a, those are yeah. ideas, right? I, I was just going to say, context, like everything else, is created in language. Right on. So you can actually create a context, and then the thing is this, that context opens up new possibilities for being an action, that, and it also opens up new perceptions of things that you were there that you may have not seen before because you didn't have this way of looking, this way of perceiving that's given by the context. And that can change the whole ball game. Yeah. And okay. The, a lot of times context. we don't we don't recognize context because then we just say, "Oh, that's the way it is. That is the world. Right. That's life. That's reality." Right? And we don't realize that's a context. That's so right. then, if that's we want to build a context and we're going to build it with languaging, and then what we have to do is start to look at the languaging that brought us here and what is the languaging that's running right now. And I'm totally mm -hmm. into that. I, that's my whole experiment in these months, in the, in this in this six months that I've been here. And I'm looking at all my languaging and, and I'm coaching people all around me to look at their languaging. And, and that's why yeah. spirituality is so ineffective in so, many, in, in so many parts of the world because in a way it divides and says, okay, there's being and then there's language, there's words and talking and thinking. And then thinking is no good, you know, that's limited. Push it down, you know. And so they don't, wanna, they don't even look at language, you know. They just say, what's the point, you know. I mean, I'm being now, and I'm in vastness, and I'm just space, and I'm formless. And the form, all those words, you know, uh, those, that's where it hurts, right. And I, I wanted to get away from all that hurt, so I left those words behind, and I don't need them, you know. And so then they still operate in all their old contexts, which are built on all words uh, and belief structures, if they're unconscious. And, uh, you know, I totally, totally am on your wavelength on that. So let's, yeah, and, let's build some contexts. And the, and the thing about context is that what you, what you discover for yourself is that if you create a powerful context that you can uh, keep present for yourself. See, that's another thing. That it's one thing to create a context, but context isn't something that you create and then it operates on its own and changes your perception and your experience. Once you create a context, just like you said, in order to recognize the power of context on your current life, you have to look and see what the context is so that you can see the relationship between the context and how things show up. Right on. But Once you start you looking at that, you can realize, hey, this is only my context, you know, this is not anything special, you know, this is, this is different than everyone, everyone else has got their own. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm calling a story in a way. Yeah, but it's everyone's got their own story, but we share context. You know, there's yeah. context. Of, there's a context of unworkability that we all live in uh, within, and it has a profound effect on the way things occur for for all of us. It's it has had a profound effect on the things that you've been saying in this conversation. If you create a context for workability in your life, and then you keep that context present for yourself, and you create new possibilities for ways of being and acting in your life and you keep those present for yourself on a consistent basis and you're aware of the internal states that can constrain you in terms of being free to operate powerfully then things can be very different very quickly. What you say is totally beautiful that a context for workability or a context for not workability, unworkability you know and totally the whole government, the politicians, uh, I mean the way we run countries and, and run society is all on a context of unworkability, right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the lesser of two evils or five evils or a thousand evils, right? We think we're at the lesser of, of evils. But the context is total uh, unworkability, which you say is totally brilliant, you know, actually to consciously uh, build a context for workability, all right? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally love what you said there. And then to keep it present for yourself so that you can and create possibilities within that context for the future that you can live into. And then if you're freed up from the past, the future is actually giving you who to be by the context you've created. The future actually gives you, it uses you. It actually gives you who to be. It gives you what actions to take that are consistent with the future you're creating for yourself. Yeah, that's, that's new. Effective. No, no, I love it. I know. I, I see. I see. You know, we finally got it out of the box here. I totally see it. You know that uh, that's fantastic. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe we uh, exposed enough right now, and maybe I don't know. What's my next uh, task? I should look over this material, and we should uh, we should b start uh, context building, or <laughs> we could talk about well. Uh, what I mean, could I be next? That, yeah, I think that you should do your homework, and then after that, I think we can continue to talk about the, the, this possibility. Con See, it's, to me, this is a conversation for possibilities. You know, it's a conversation for possibilities, and it's an exploration of what's possible. It's a conversation to distinguish what's not working and see it clearly so we can get access to the source of that, and we can get access to what could work and then create that possibility and bring it forth in action and, and behavior and being, states of being. So uh, I would like to continue along those veins and also to bring out the fact that this conversation is distinctly different from, uh, you know, you mentioned you didn't want to be a teacher, right? And, but I'm, I, I don't want to be a teacher either. I do want to be a leader, right? And, I, and the, the, the thing is this, I don't want to be a teacher like I know something you don't know and I'm going to tell you, then you'll know it too. Because it's been my experience that it, that just hasn't made much of a difference. I'm interested in being useful. I'm interested in making a contribution and making a difference. And I think this new possibility of leadership is the key to doing that. And I think that part of it is that we have to include, see, in this new technology, it doesn't get into a lot of hocus-pocus and mystical, spiritual ideas based on some of the traditional context from the East and so forth. It doesn't get into any of those things, right? As close as it comes to any of that is to say that who you are is like a clearing for possibility. That who we are is like a clearing, like a space in which things occur. And, uh, you know, my experience of that is that that's already the case. You don't have to do anything about that. That's already the case. That's one of the reasons why I think this whole notion of uh, trying to accomplish something spiritually is going backwards. Because if you're already who you are, then trying to become you, you know... Yeah, you really, then that. act like it. I mean, if you're already who you are, then act like it, right? But you see, you can't because you're captured by the constraints that exist in your internal experience that's given by conditioning and so forth. Well, you're so captured by a context of unworkability, right? Yeah, uh, for one, got, you know, that's what's got to be and like you're saying, yeah. like uh, we all know. I mean, anyone can say, uh, can see that a context is you're working inside of a box, right? And and if your context is unworkability, then uh, you're just trying to get the lesser of of uh, various evils and just hoping hoping for the best, right? And uh, and uh, just saying, and your whole definition is that there's conflicting interests, and those interests will never match up, you know, because you're Mm -hmm. And so then you are telling people, uh, you're, you know, you're the reminder, you're the hinter, you, you know, you're the leader, and you're not telling anyone anything that they don't already know, that they just never thought you could have a context of workability, because how would it work? Because there's conflicting interests. And you could say, right. well, there's also some interests that are not conflicting, that are overriding, you know, that are uh, in, the interest in, in, in being human and the interest in expressing yourself and the interest in finding love. and. And then uh, yeah. whatever those could be, you know, each can, can, yeah. can, and then you're saying, as far as I understand, that we get together and we, uh, and it's a think tank, you know, and, and we all contribute and, and, uh, yeah. and try to make uh, an agreement that uh, uh, the works inside that, how to build this context, right, and make a reality of it and not only a pipe dream. 
That's right. That's exactly right. And the uh, and and the other thing, just take one context, and and, I, and and it's not like there has to be one context. There can be many contexts that are overlapping and interlocking. For example, one context that could be created is a context called a you and me world instead of a you or me world. And then how would people show up in that world? Do you see, as different from a you or me world. So it's not you or me. It's I'm going to make it with you. I'm uh, not. Uh, not. I'm going to make it with or without you. Oh yeah. So uh, that's, that, a that's a good topic. one because we can practice that on our wife, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, this is. I'll tell you. That's where I have. Uh, that's been, been my proving ground for this material. Is in my relationship with my wife and the people closest to me. That can be the laboratory where you discover mm -hmm. uh, the effectiveness of this technology and that the effectiveness of this work. Well, that's a beautiful you, context right there, is my life is my laboratory. Because it's not right. all, uh, you know, do or die, believe in this, no, no, believe my way, no, no, you got to be this way, and just say, look, give it a shot. You've tried it the other way for years and years and years. How has it worked, you know? <laughs> that's right. And one of the other things, I'll just mention this, but we can go into it uh, later in more detail. But one of the other aspects of this material is about integrity. And one of the things about human beings is they don't have integrity. Uh, they consistently act inconsistent with what they say. Uh, and uh, so in, the, in a context of unworkability, in integrity really doesn't matter much, you know, because you've got to do what you've got to do and you can justify it, you know. And yeah. being honest all the time doesn't really, you know, it's considered kind of a moral thing. But the integrity that's talked about in this work is not moral or ethical. It's literally scientific in the sense that it is about the idea that for things to work, there must be integrity. And what it boils down to is it's not an ethical or it's not a moral situation. It's a situation where unless you can have your word matter, unless you can have what you say matter and be, the, uh, be responsible or honor your word, that doesn't mean to always keep your word because that's unrealistic. Yeah, we get, if, we get convinced into saying something that we really are, are not capable of saying. I mean, any, yeah. any kind of context of honesty has to have a context of amending my agreements, right? Yeah, it has to have a context of authenticity, that you don't say anything you don't mean. You don't say you're going to do anything you don't intend to really yeah, do. Yeah, you don't try to and, talk people into saying something. I think that Est was always, I think Werner was always trying to talk you into saying something that you didn't know if you me meant it or not. And he says, try it on, you know. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's part of, of, of what it takes to, to realize things for yourself is to try it on and see if it works. You know, if you really invest yourself in it and take it seriously and do the work necessary to see these things for yourself in your own experience, and then you, uh, you apply them to your life and they work, well, you, know, you don't need to listen to anybody or believe anybody. You've got a direct experience of workability for yourself. And so integrity is a key part of that uh, because it's just scientific in the sense that if you don't do what you say you're going to do, how effective can you possibly be? Yeah, you don't believe in yourself anymore. So then you, know, you don't correct. believe in your own words even. So then how are you going to be that's motivated right. to, to... So then, I mean, we think of that with child rearing, don't we? We try to give them a small challenge that they can accomplish and keep them accomplishing, 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 and, uh, uh, and not give them a lot of uh, challenges that are way over their head and where, they're, where, where it's not going to uh, happen and they're going to get used to never doing anything. Well, one of the problems with the way uh, integrity has been dealt with in the past is that uh, people think it's right to keep your word and wrong to break your word. So that means you're not trustable and you're a bad person and, you know, all those kinds of things. And that really gets in the way of seeing the scientific aspect of integrity in terms of it just disempowers you as a person not to have integrity. And integrity doesn't involve always keeping your word. It simply involves honoring your word. So you can maintain integrity by uh, not keeping your word, but when you don't keep your word, to acknowledge that you didn't keep your word and do whatever it needs to get done, you know, to correct that situation, yeah. that maintains trust with people. Or to amend it, you know, that's what I was saying. I mean, there should be a way to amend, and there, we do have divorce, actually. <laughs> you well, can amend your word. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, yeah. it's more, in, it's got more integrity than just leaving, leaving the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you can, you know, part of it, you can amend your word, but it's dealing with it is what I'm saying. It's dealing with it. Yeah, it's yeah. not just uh, having the idea that it's okay not to keep it and not seeing the unworkability of that. The other thing that comes along with it, if you get what integrity actually is, is that people really do a, uh, a cost-benefit analysis of what they're going to give their word to before they give their word so that uh, they they don't give their word to things that they can't see themselves following through with right. um, yeah we know and, ourselves yeah so it makes it a lot more workable and right uh, part of having the world work is to have integrity right on. It's, a, it's it's a simple thing but that's something that people have to discover as a necessary element something that they can see that they can do without being guilty and without, you know, being wrong and so forth, uh, that it's simply a practice that's about being effective in life, that's all. Let's just do this. We'll, uh, you know, I'll get in, get more involved in some of the material you pointed me toward, and then we can kind of plan uh, uh, what, how we can, where we'll take it, and uh, what we can do to effectively communicate this, and then, uh, you know, I'm not ready to give, I'm not ready to give my word right now. It's like uh, <laughs> when we're going to meet again, you know, but it could be soon. I think it could be certainly uh, within some days or a week. And uh, uh, let's just uh, see how we can make this more clear to everyone that's listening to us. Yeah, you know, I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, once you get freed from constraints, once you see the possibility of being free from constraints, and you really get clear that, you know, to have a life that really works is to have a life that's not about you. It is to have a life that's about being in the world and being able to be useful and make a contribution. You know, that kind of gives you a life that has a lot of quality to it, you know, and a lot of fulfillment and satisfaction in it. And so for me... One of the things that's evident at this point in the game is that I'm looking to take on the biggest challenge possible, like like having an impact on humanity. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I'm not, you know, because I want to keep my word, right? I just want to uh, change my family and my friends and uh, and uh, people that watch Never Not Here, and then uh, we'll see if we can convince someone to make a model and uh, see what these different models can look like. And I'm not trying to change humanity, you know, because I want to. I want to. I want to have a success track, you know, of where uh, uh, where I build, and, uh, and I don't want to go give a TED talk, you know, tomorrow because I don't think mine would be the best TED talk, and uh, so. Uh, but still, I want to uh, talk with uh, David, so <laughs> we'll get we'll get that going again. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something, Richard. I, you know, uh, I. You're an open possibility to me, so I listen to what you're saying, but I don't necessarily take it to be gospel. That that could all change. Oh yeah, as right. You get, <laughs> as you get further into this, you might find out for yourself that you know taking on making an impact on humanity isn't a matter of of not keeping your word. I could keep my word until I die. I might not succeed before I die, but I could keep my word until I yeah. die. Well, there's some part of somebody out there is watching Never Not Here. I get a few views, so that some some part of humanity I am changing. <laughs> yeah. So you are. You're making obviously. That's why I'm talking to you because you're somebody who's making a difference, and uh, and I'm interested in having the difference you're making be enlarged as great as it could be, and making use of the difference you make to make the difference I want to make. Right on. That's the way we, we need to uh, collaborate. I love it. Okay. okay. I thank you, David. I totally thank you. Okay, so let's be in touch. And uh, after you've uh, kind of gotten into some of the material and, uh, and you feel like you're ready to talk again and continue the conversation, let me know and we'll schedule that. That away. Okay, thanks everyone for listening, and uh, I don't know, I think we're going to get into something here, you know. David and me, what do we agree on? Mostly we agree that the rubber has to hit the road. There's got to be traction somewhere, you know, and it's got to, and we got to get traction on the game we're playing called Life in, on Planet Earth, right? And uh, yeah, we have to kind of center ourselves and uh, know what's, know who we really are, and, uh, and you know, maybe that takes disengagement, but then we said make a difference on the world, and have a bigger game, that is totally engagement, because how can we be more than uh, just about ourselves if we're only talking to ourselves, you know? We have to kind of somehow 
get involved on many, many fronts. And uh, that means saying yes, or if we don't even have to say yes, all we have to do is stop saying no, right? And so then, uh, thanks for coming, thanks for listening, and uh, I think you'll, if we were too long-winded, uh, we'll try to crispen it up the next time. So, okay. <laughs> thanks again, David, and uh, wonderful. Right. wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye.